Good evening, everybody, um, or perhaps good morning if you're dialing in from the other side of the Atlantic. And my name is Janet Coyle. I'm the Managing Director for Business at London and Partners. That's London's um, International Trade Investment and Promotion Agency. And we're also the co-founders of London Tech Week, together with Tech London Advocates and Informer Tech Founders. So I'm thrilled to be here this evening. We've had a really interesting afternoon. Um, kicked off by the Secretary of State for Trade, who was sharing some really exciting new plans that the government have launched today to really help our tech companies to, to export more and to really leverage the opportunities in our international markets. We then have Brent Hoberman chatting to Tim Draper about the investment landscape in the US. And, and also it's great to hear how excited he was about the buzz that he was really feeling about Europe right now. Um, and then we had a really interesting VC panel talking about valuations and talking about all the sort of great funding opportunities that the government's been really opening up to our sort of startups and scale ups. So a really interesting afternoon. And we're now shifting our focus to sort of broader inward investment into the UK and that sort of broader investment landscape. Um, Lord Grinstone, who's going to be joining me very shortly, has extensive business experience um, from his time at Barclays Bank and Standard Life. So really thrilled to be having a conversation with him this evening. Now, his responsibilities include all aspects of the UK's real investment strategy, promotion, marketing, you know, engaging with these international businesses and really sort of selling the UK as, as a place to invest. And I have to say, there's, there's probably never been a more challenging time to take on a role like this. Lord, Lord Grinstone was appointed Minister of Investment in March. And we all know on the 23rd of March, you know, we all went into, into lockdown and it's been a real challenging time. Um, and all the data shows that FDI flows, that's foreign direct investment, globally is down by about 40%. And countries are having to really compete for any business that's looking to still expand and, and, and move into Europe. So we're having to compete quite hard with, with all our sort of European counterparts. So um, thrilled to have Lord Grimstone with us this evening. Welcome Lord Grimstone. Um, absolutely thrilled for you to be here with us. Um, so if I could just sort of kick off our conversation um, and if just in broad terms, if you could share with us, I mean, since you've been appointed this role, how that sort of inward investment landscape for the UK has totally shifted and your perspective on that. Yes, well, certainly. And thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, look, I feel strangely overdressed for this fireside chat because I just come from the House of Lords and there's some convention there where you have to dress like this. Um, normally, I can always tell if someone is in tech because they don't look like I'm looking now. So please, please, Absolutely please excuse right. that for the, for the audience. But look, it's a, it's a great question, but of course, it's not just foreign investment has changed, everything has changed. And look, I, I, I know we all know how awful the pandemic is, but it's worth just reminding ourselves, this is the worst thing that has happened in my lifetime, and the economic consequences of this are going to be the worst thing that has happened in my, in my, in my lifetime. And the landscape, as we come out of this, is going to look extraordinarily different. Um, I became a minister, gosh, nine weeks, 10 weeks ago. I've had half a day in the office since then. And the rest of that time, I have been acting entirely um, um, uh, through video conferencing. So I spend 12 hours a day doing this, communicating with CEOs and ministers around the world. But in one way, how remarkable that is. Yeah, and and I think that aspect of of this terrible crisis is going to be with us, and it's going to affect, of course, um, investment trends going forward. So, with all these conversations that you're having with with CEOs around the world, are you actually seeing some sectors that actually you're seeing growth, and there is an opportunity to try and persuade them to still consider the UK? Well, look, technology in its broader sense, of course, is, 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 is right up there. But I don't think people yet fully understand how much change there is going to be. We all know there was a lot of trends already happening, a lot of tech trends, a lot of, a lot of deep tech trends, a lot of artificial intelligence trends. I think what the crisis has done has speeded up the, uh, the, the, the actual maturing of those trends sevenfold, 
tenfold. Um, I'll give you an example. I was talking to the, the CEO of a mid-sized UK bank a couple of weeks ago, and they were early on moving all their call center staff to work from home. But very good distributed software, and he was saying the productivity of their of their of their people has increased by 40% since they did that. But more importantly, or as importantly, people are a lot happier. And he was saying to me, will we ever move these people back to a, a tech center, to, 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 to a call center again? Mm -hmm. Tech has revolutionized the way that they're working. They like it. We like it. Why won't we, why won't we keep it there? The, dem the demise of the office. Who believes that you know people will be going going to an office five five days a week, nine till six, nine to whatever? That's all 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 changing. And of course, all those societal and technology trends will feed through to investment trends in due course. Yeah, and no, I recognise that. I think the future of work and the future of that whole landscape will be very, very different globally, not just in the UK. But what does that mean for the UK? Does it mean that sort of these big international companies may, may not need as big a footprint here in the future? And how can we, as a, as a country, make sure that we're prepared to actually target and engage with the, the right businesses who, do, who are looking international and, and making sure that we don't miss out to those other, other countries that might be a little bit more proactive, perhaps, in engaging well, with some of those businesses? Um, Look, first of all, I think people's the size of people's footprints and the nature of the footprints is going to is going to change. Yeah. There's always been three kinds of investment. There's the old fashioned foreign direct investment. You see a green field somewhere, you build a factory and you make things in the country. You have um, portfolio investment where you 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 buy shares in a listed company, maybe on the A market, maybe on the main market, and you have influence through that. But increasingly, you're seeing fund investment, VC funds, PE funds, which take a major stake in a company, major stake in a tech firm, and they and they bring a lot of skills to it. These are not remote shareholders; they're bringing they're bringing real skills. Well, we've seen a real shift away from the what I call the old-fashioned investment into that newer form of investment, and of course, tech is ideally suited for that. And why do people want to invest in UK, UK tech? It is because, quite simply, because of the caliber of the, of the people here. Um, we were able to reach critical mass here perfectly early on. And, of course, the great advantage of critical mass is the whole synergizing you get from people working together. I mean, one of the things I was closely involved in at Barclays was the Barclays Rise Rises business, and whether yeah. people know of these, but basically um, the bank provided space, cheap or free space. Um, it had to look like a warehouse, so you had to have cables hanging down from the ceiling, and you gave space to, to small tech startups to, to do stuff. And this wasn't a, a, a mm -hmm. commercial matter. Of course, you know, the managing directors of the bank used to wander around, chat to the guys, get some ideas. But the synergies you got and the energy you got from those people just working together was was ginormous. And because the UK, you know, was early on, OK, you know, New York was there, but we were there. And there's something about there's something about London is its ability to draw in global talent for something like that. Now, one thing that is critically important going forward, and which I'm very alive to, is that we have to structure our rules going forward so as to still make sure that global talent can come to London and to, and to do this. Because we will absolutely remain a vibrant centre for tech and for tech investing, provided we have the people here to do it. The people here. No, absolutely agree. I mean, talent is the number one reason why why um, why these funders are choosing London and choosing choosing our talent. Definitely. But how do we do that? How do we make sure that we have that competitive edge? We have it now. I'm absolutely convinced. And all the data today of you know record levels of investment last year into the UK. You know, way punching way above our weight with our European counterparts. But we need to stay front and centre. 
um, for those investors. We heard Tim Draper earlier talking about, you know, how he sees a real energy and a real buzz in Europe, but right across Europe. And, you know, we are collaborating, we're partnering with European cities, which is absolutely the right thing to do. But as the UK, um, we do need to make sure that we, we continue to invest in our talent. Yes. Um, and, and we just need to make sure that we, we absolutely retain that competitive edge. Um, can I just talk about, we talk a lot about this, this pandemic and the way, um, the way things are changing for the future and for the long term. You know, we know that the workplace is going to be very different, as you say, and we know that you know, foreign direct investment is definitely changing. You're absolutely right. We all need to think very differently about investment now into the UK, and, um, and it's taking very, very many different forms. So I'm, I'm really pleased that the, the government's recognising that as well. But given that you led you know, standard life during, um, during a recession, just during that sort of financial crisis, are there any sort of lessons that you learned through that that you're now bringing into your role during this pandemic? Yeah, look, absolutely. And that's a really great, really great question. I mean, the analogy I like is um, when that um, meteor hit the Earth, gosh, how many billions of years ago, and the dinosaurs became extinct. Yeah. Did all of life on the Earth become extinct? No, it didn't. So who survived? the organisms and the life forms that were able to adapt most quickly to the new environment. And I think this shock that we're going through is in some ways not dissimilar to that. So my advice to anybody on this call is yeah. that you have to start thinking about things in a different way. And it may be that some of the ideas, old ideas still work, but this is a completely new environment that we're going to be facing. Now, that one, one level, it's challenging, but also, as I've, I learned from my previous business life, that challenge throws up opportunities for those who are quick-witted to take advantage of it. And I think that um, I saw a survey of tech companies recently by, um, 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 by Innovate UK, and it said that one of the things that tech companies want most is exposure to overseas markets and internationalization. Now, what is one of the quickest ways of doing that? It's having a overseas shareholder or an overseas fund put some money into your tech firm. I don't mean to control it, but putting, providing some of the finance. Because as soon as somebody has a financial interest in you, by definition, their markets are open to, yeah. to you. And if I thought that the future of my tech company was in Japan, or I thought that it was in in, 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 in Switzerland, boy, would I be looking for a Japanese investor or for a Swiss investor to help facilitate that. And part of my department's job, um, and it's um, a bit more sophisticated than speed dating, but not always a lot more sophisticated than speed dating, it is matching people. It's matching the right investor to the right opportunity. And it's showcasing what we have to offer here and using that to attract um, in international attention. And I think in some ways, and I think as you're seeing this webinar tonight, in a strange way, the crisis has made it easier to do that. I think that I'm probably on webinars three times a day, four times a day. Yeah. So I am communicating with thousands of people. Today. Well, imagine if we can set things up so that tech firms can communicate with thousands of investors. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we started a series of virtual trade missions a couple of weeks ago where we took a, a group of tech companies to New York for the day, you know, via this platform. So, you know, it is opening up new ways of working. Um, and I completely hear you about, you know, matching that talent. I think I would really be interested to hear your perspective around these sort of new trade deals that are being negotiated. You know, Liz Trust talked about them earlier, and we're all sort of waiting to see the deals that are being done. And I know there's conversations happening in Japan right now. So, you know, how do you sort of see those as, a, as an opportunity for trade and investment? Because if we're sort of, you know, breaking down any of those barriers and building more bridges to to, to be able to negotiate for UK tech firms. Yep, yep, certainly. How do you see well, that look, shifting the landscape? Um, trade policy. You, was something that was done by highly skilled tech, techno, technocrats in 
back door rooms. And whoever at the pub or in the coffee bar would talk about trade policy. But actually, what's becoming clear to me since I've been here is that free trade agreements the is the need to operationalize them. And one of the things that we now have to do now we're in these negotiations is mm. to make sure that companies, large and small, understand what the benefits will be to them going forward. You know, for example, in digital services, having an agreement with a with a country that allows the free exchange of of, of data, that provides proper protection for data services, that eliminates bureaucracy. Now, these all seem in the abstract, quite technical things. But once you start translating those into what does it mean for a company that they are able to provide digital services to Japan, to America, to Australia, to New Zealand, across the Pacific, with no barriers, as if they were providing those you know, within, within their own country, these are enormous opportunities. So our strategy is to put the UK at the center of a global web of those relationships. And this is a very competitive world that we live in. Investment is a competitive sport. So we have to identify the unique selling propositions which are gonna make the UK the place to be. And one of the things we want us to be is this global hub. And we want that not just to be in London, we want to spread that across the, the nation um, a lot of the advantage comes from linking educational establishments. Um, um, there's fantastic work goes on between um, tech firms and educational establishments. Yeah. I was much much involved with an um, organization called um, 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 Conception X, which, which operates with deep tech um, PhD students. And whilst they're still doing their PhD, is training them, if they wish to, as to how to be entrepreneurs. Yes. Not seeing it as an alternative to their research, but seeing it as part of their research. Now, I find things like that really, really exciting to be working yes, on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, can I go on to some questions? Because I think um, I think we could go on a little bit longer, hopefully. But we have got some questions from the audience. Um, well, we talked a little bit about trade deals just now, and you talked about our ability to negotiate probably through this pandemic hopefully some good trade deals. Um, going forward, which will be the most important market? So we talk about this sort of global network, which sounds great, absolutely harnessing our talent, using our talent as ambassadors around the world. Um, which markets, if you were have to sort of focus in on three or four key international markets that we really need to be going after right now, which would those be? Go where the money is and go where the growth is. Where is the size? It's in the US. Where's the growth? It's in Asia. And that's right across, right across Asia. Like I've had the benefit in my working career of living in Asia, living in the US. I'm, I, I would call myself a globalist. I, I've operated in more than 60 countries. And the, say the mantra is, go where the flows are, go where the interest is, go where the growth is. Okay, so US and Asia, not Europe right now? Uh, look, in, in, in a way, I, I think London is Europe. I think people in Europe will come to will come to London. Look, I, and, and I've got you know this, this huge, huge close ties with 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 Europe. But as I say, go to where the eco economic growth is. Go to where the buzz is. Go to where the the search is for new ideas and for innovation. Okay, and I said another question is from your perspective, Lord Grinstone. Do you think that this crisis that we're all living and, and breathing it could potentially be masking something a little bit deeper. You know, should we be looking a little bit longer term? Um, and are we missing any opportunities that might be sort of around the corner because we're all focused on this sort of crisis phase well, right now? Look, and it's, of course, it's right and proper that we are focused on the crisis phase now. But I, I love this concept of build back better. As I was saying earlier, the world is going to be different, but let's make it a better world going forward. Let's emphasize clean growth. Let's emphasize the advantage that technology can bring to people. Let's, let's emphasize communication like this where we're sharing ideas. So for goodness sake, 
don't let's lose some of this. This is a terrible crisis, but mm. at least, and it's an awful thing even to say this, let's hope that some good comes out of it um, in relation to some of these changes being embedded in the way that society operates and the way we work. I can see a new campaign now, Build Back Better, when we have those sort of the, the daily updates from, from government. One, one member of the audience has just probably made a comment more than a question. I think it was back to your earlier point, Lord Grimstone, around, um, around everyone feeling happier when they're working remotely and productivity is up and isn't it great? Um, but one of the audiences has, has really made a comment about mental well-being. And, of course, and of course, of course. Isolated. So we just of need course. to have, you know, just respect that really. No, of course, look, I completely respect that. And, and it, was, it was interesting that what I should have added is it was often teams of couples who were enjoying doing this together. I am huge, and I've always been a huge supporter of mental health, having had some issues myself in the past. And I think I'm hugely supportive of people who have had, had to work through stress, live through stress. If I can give just one word of advice to people, it's try not to live in one's own head at the moment. Even though it's difficult, maintain human contact, maintain communication with people. Thank you, Jerry. Um, final question, I think, and we're gonna to have to wrap it this up soon, unfortunately. Um, but there's a question around, you know, this afternoon's all, all been about the state of investment and you've very kindly shared some of your perspectives. Um, what role do actual investors play as we're looking towards our sort of transitioning into recovery? From your perspective, from the government perspective, what do you think investors should be doing right now? Bringing us new perspectives. I mean, in, investors are highly incentivized to read the, the zeitgeist and the mood of the times. Um, yeah. Investors are looking for growth, looking for opportunities. So don't just see investors as a source of money, see them as a source of ideas and of encouraging innovation. Thank you. And how does the government engage with those investors to get their perspectives? Talk to them frequently. And one, one change that we're making is to bring the what I call the investor lens into the Department of International Trade. I mean, we have highly skilled people in the, in the department, but I learned here when I was a young banker, you might want to sell something, but somebody else has to buy it for it to be a transaction. So you have to bring the views of the investor into the heart of the organization. You have to understand what they're looking to invest in. And also importantly, you have to understand what is stopping them making investments and remove those barriers. And that's my mission, it's to remove barriers to investment in the United Kingdom and especially in the tech sector. Right, thank you so much. So, you know, just to quickly, quickly summarize, um, you know, it's, it's really, we need to keep focusing on our talent, building those global networks, removing those barriers, um, leveraging the opportunities with these new free trade agreements, or not free trade agreements, but with the trade agreements. Um, really harness this acceleration of the digital transformation that we're all experiencing and really, you know, take learnings for the longer term in terms of future of work. Um, but I think the sort of the campaign we're going to see going forward sounds like Build Back Better, which sounds very positive. Thank you so much for your time, Lord Grimstone. It's been an absolute pleasure having a conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.